Hey everyone, uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, or night, wherever you're calling in from. Um, I already see in the chat, there's people from all over the world. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Vera. Uh, I'm part of the Future Sketches group at the Media Lab. And uh, yeah, this is actually our last uh, computational uh, typography talk of the, the series. Um, and I just want to make a few announcements before we start. Uh, so first of all, a big thank you for you for joining. Um, also for Zach Lieberman, who is my BI, who is also here uh, in, in the chat, um, and for MIT Media Lab for letting us do this. Um, and also Blair Fell uh, is here in the chat uh, interpreting, and he's been, been doing that for all the talks. So. Uh, we're so grateful for that. Um, uh, so if you want to see the ASL interpretation, you can uh, yeah, see him in the chat. Um, and yeah, so uh, there's two small announce announcements. So first of all, there's an open call uh, for a position at the MIT Media Lab uh, uh, for being a faculty uh, for transformative design. Um, we'll post a link in the chat, uh, and if that's something you might be interested in or you know anyone that might be interested, uh, please uh, apply. We're really looking for applications. Um, and then secondly, um, also Future Sketches, the, the, the research group I'm also part of, is also uh, admitting students this year. So um, uh, we've had an information uh, hour a few weeks ago. Uh, that we can send you the link for. Um, and yeah, if you're interested in applying, um, you can find more information on the website. We'll also post the links for that. Um, so yeah, um, this is the last uh, talk of the series. Uh, we'll shortly post the transcribed um, talks on the website on the same page where you found the Zoom link. Um, and I'm very, very thrilled uh, that we're, the last talk is going to be with DS Studio. Um, and DS Studio is a branding and design uh, company uh, that you, you most likely know. Um, they're kind of groundbreaking. They make very groundbreaking work and also uh, coined the term kinetic, kinetic typography. Um, and so they're based kind of in two places. They're, uh, part of them is in uh, New York City uh, and a part of them in Chamonix in, Fr in France. And so I think their work is really interesting because they have this really new approach to graphic design that is really about motion and typography. And they make generative tools for it. Uh, and yeah, basically um, a more generative design approach to uh, branding. Um, and so they also do a lot of teaching. So Mitch, uh, the creative director, he's been teaching um, at HET in Geneva and the Royal Academy of Design uh, in, uh, or of art and design in The Hague. Um, and he was also a resident prof professor at La Bec and Ecole, uh, residency uh, in Switzerland. And yeah, so he, his course also really implements this uh, mode of thought that Dia has. And then today we have Daniel Wenzel with us, who is also part of DIA. Um, so he's an art director. Um, uh, he studied at Constance in, uh, in Germany and also taught a little bit all over the place, but one of them was also Elisava Barcelona. And so he does, he's focused more on the computational side of the work that DIA does. So uh, we're so happy to have him here. Please give him a very warm applause. And the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. One second, give me, here we go. All right, I hope everybody can see that. Wait, let me double check something. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, you can hear me, right? You can see this, you can hear me? Yes, cool. perfect. So. Uh, so thank you, Vera, for the for the nice introduction, and I'm so pleased to be here today, and um, that we got invited. And it's 
it's such a pleasure. So um, yeah, my name is my name is Daniel Wenzel, and I'm here today to represent the studio. And um, the studio, as Mera, Mera kind of like said said a lot of things already. So we the studio started in 2008, and I'm with them since 2017. And yeah, we are mostly known for like kinetic identities and typographic systems. So kinetic identities, like the fusion between uh, motion and branding. And then yeah, with a focus on type. So we do like custom typefaces and transform type through motion and generative design. So um, at the core, the studio is relatively small. So we are just four people. That means um, it's like the two founders, uh, Mac and Mitch and then uh, Diana and me. And then depending on the project, um, we are like working with like specialists and experts to complement our work. So extension. Um, and also this, so like, yeah, we are split into two postcards at the moment. So uh, Chamonix and New York. So we, we chose skyline and mountains. And before I'm diving into into the theme of the day, I give uh, Steve Steve Jobs my my introduction. There was an article in Scientific American uh, in the early 70s which compared the efficiency of locomotion for various species of things on the planet, and they ranked them. And it turns out the condor won. Condor was the most efficient, and man came in with a rather unimpressive showing about a third of the way down the list. But someone there had the insight to test the efficiency of man riding a bicycle. And man riding a bicycle was twice as good as the condor, all the way off the end of the list. And what it really illustrated was man's ability as a tool maker. We're basically fashioning a 21st century bicycle here, which can amplify an inherent intellectual ability that man has and really take care of a lot of drudgery to free people to do much more creative work. So yeah, that's, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about tools. And um, yeah, the, the series. It's called computational typography. And the reason why I'm here today is um, that I am computer boy. So that's my nickname at the studio. That's actually a drawing from Vienna that I have tattooed on my ankle on company money. And um, yeah, the reason that I'm computer boy doesn't mean that like I I strictly do everything with programming. It's more that like our, our studio philosophy is actually that we're like just using any tool um, that that we can find any software, everything, anything that like makes makes our life, our um, process easier. So if I have to like point out one specific tool that we are using a lot, it's it's for example After Effects. So if I take After Effects and just like see it as a tool, which it is, like let's say it's a hammer, and then I get presented um, like I get presented with a problem, like let's say it's a it's a screw. This is like the project. This is the the thing to solve. And of course, I can take the hammer and I have it already, right? So I can somewhat figure it out and get the screw in the wall. But maybe it makes more sense to to use a different tool, to use a screwdriver. But then there's also that's also me, right? So like I really enjoy thinking about. Yeah, like thinking about ideas, coming up with concepts, but the execution part is not really like what uh, is not really my most favorite part of it. So why would I use a screwdriver if I can't use a drill? So that's why we're going to talk about automation and AI later in the talk. All right, the first uh, project that I that I'm gonna like peek in a little bit is Squarespace. It's um, we did like their branding a couple of years ago and. Um, that's a pretty extensive project, so I'm not gonna like go too deep into the weeds here. So let's just like focus on like one specific treatment. So if you're looking at this, uh, what it's doing is is you take a piece of content and you're like transforming it into these like cube structures, sculptures, however you want to call it, and then they can serve. Um, wait, one step too far, and um, these structures like start not like in a project, uh, in a program already, it's like actually starts with a sketch. So um, it's not that we're like, just like diving into into the tools. It's like, you're like drawing it, see how, how you can come up with the solution. And then once you found the solution, how to use it, you can, um, this can serve as as transitional devices or like to, to create prints from 
uh, more legible to less legible. So these are, for example, uh, things that that they have in their lobby in in their New York office. And then, um, yeah, more recently, like when they got listed in the New York Stock Exchange, like we we created like even more like expressive pieces for like that that lived on Times Square. So the reason I bring this specific um, yeah this this one uh, treatment up is um, that there's not one specific tool that we used to create those. Like there's actually, it exists in multiple tools. So we have that built in After Effects, we have uh, versions of it in code and some in um, in 3D software, like in cinema. And the reason for that is that every software has its advantages and uh, sometimes it makes more sense to use one over the other. So uh, maybe it makes, not the most sense to be this like expert in just in After Effects and do everything with After Effects, right? So maybe it makes more sense to to create a toolbox, so somewhat like this. And um, yeah, the way you get there is you just like go out out and look what what tools exist and maybe like try them and test them and see, yeah, see if they are for you and if the, if you can like get an advantage on on some projects there. So the way we attack this is, or we tackle this is um, R&D, so research and development. We had this project a while ago, like for, for Nike, where we did apparel. Um, so we did like textures, patterns um, that they then used to like print on, on backpacks, on sweatshirts. And um, yeah, the, the beauty of this project was that we had, um, it allowed us to do a lot of like exploration and research and testing during the project phase. So this is like all the testing that happened like to, to make those like prints, to make those panels. And uh, one thing that you may notice is that um, we are misusing tools a lot. So we're doing things like using After Effects, like so animation, animation software to do print, for example. And uh, one reason why you would want to maybe misuse tools is um, because you don't know any better, which is totally fine. If um, if you get to the result, that's um, that's okay. But maybe um, you you just see advantages in some tool that that other uh, tools that others don't have. So you just use that because it's like maybe better suited for what you're trying to do. So um, not every time you get like that um, yeah, pleasant project that like allows for like a lot of like uh, an extensive testing or research phase. So a lot of like projects are like short schedule. Yeah, you can't, you can't always do that. So what we do a lot is just like self-initiated research. So for example, things like this, like in a, um, those are like visuals we created for, for the type foundry monkey type. And in the middle, for example, you see like Conway's Game of Life with uh, letters, that, like so it's like separating vowels and consonants. And um, that doesn't always have to be like one one specific idea that then like is is done and you move on. It can also like look somewhat like this. So um, you have an idea once, create like figure it out, and then you like keep exploring on it. So how how does it work if I introduce color? If I use different tiling? Um, tiling patterns, etc., and um, something like this can go on and on for a long period of time, even uh, without a specific purpose in mind at first. So, Neil, let's now um, look. Oh, Daniel, sorry. Yes. Uh, to some people, the video is a bit uh, choppy. Would you mind resharing mm. uh, and selecting the um, uh, optimize for? Uh, uh, video next to this the sound one. I think then it will be better. So sorry. Which one specifically? So if you stop sharing, um, and then yes. we share again next to the sound. There's also optimized for video. Uh, optimized. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. I no, you're good. Know. You're all good. I think it will be better. Sorry to interrupt. Um, all right. Um, am I back? Am I? Because yes. now I'm not seeing you. Perfect. But all right. But that's fine. Okay. 
so let's let's dive a little bit deeper into like one uh one project and one case study so um in 2021 we got the task to create the identity for the showmore biennale in um yeah about the graphic design biennale in showmore and the theme was the theme was uh viral so the first thing that came in mind um was like things like this like viral images uh viral growth and um yeah looking at these like these initial ideas like you're like maybe maybe um there's something here maybe you can like this is something you've done before like this could be like a great starting point so that's what you do so we did like a uh, test like this for example like using like this is memes from memes but that's a little bit like doing doing eyes out of eyes and that can be fun but maybe that's like a better a better way to do it so we looked into like things like these like these like infectious viral looking things without being like too on the nose because we're still in the midst of a pandemic and um a part of like these like visuals that that we created it's also like maybe we can attack the type and like eat up the letters with with those images and um since we don't want the type to be fully defenseless we also like implement some fight or flight mechanism so the the type at least runs away for example so that's uh one part of the project because like it's um there's always like multiple things that that run in parallel the, the the other thing that you have to like look at is the typography itself so we looked into like memes viral treats um all of all of these things that like yeah it, you see a, a lot of like mixing uppercase lowercase it can get like pretty ugly so if you if you look into those kind of references maybe you like try to like do that but like with a yeah with like a little bit of sense of like swiss Swiss taste, typography, like experimental, uh, expressive, Wolfgang Weingart in the in that area, right? So um, we did a lot of like tests here, and this is like just a small grab out of the out of the series. And what we ended up with was looking somewhat like this. So you see exactly like what what we had in the memes, like uppercase, lowercase, different font sizes, um, like classic typography um, and like a little bit like weird art tracking. And um, the, th the nice thing here is that it's like, it's a system in itself. So just the typography by itself, it like adapts to different formats and um, different needs what we have in, in the, uh, for the deliveries. And if you now take these two, like one and two together, there's only like one thing left that, that we needed. We were like uh, looking for viral images that are licensable so these are this is our selection of like licensable viral images if you look close there's like mitch in the second um top top left from uh, the second from the top left there's me in there um so yeah they're viral ish images but if you now take those take uh, one and two together you basically have this and this is the identity that that we created so this is how it looks in in out of home, in uh, social media um, content, in in print. It was like all over over the city in Shomo, and yeah, because it's like a generative system that we created. Like you can do fun things like this. Like you can just take those images and replace them with the posters for the Biennale, and then yeah, you can also do that here. And this can be something that lives then in the like, in the editorial, for example. You can also do stuff like completely like leave the images away or maybe leave the let the type like leave the type away and then um create things like this like tote bags uh buttons like all kind of stuff like it was like a they had a lot of content in this in this project so but if you like go go one step back and look at the process itself again it um it essentially is like a multi-step process so you have this like type system that that is a system in itself and then this um gets this gets like one process to like have this like viral infection and then another process to like replace this viral infection with viral images so um the way we did this actually is um is after effects 
So you see on the left, you like do do the type setting. You can and just it runs through the engine, and you have the output. And then you create these. So what we're doing here is we're creating a toolkit. So that's um, essentially a tool within a tool. To give like a little bit like simpler example, because like the the Anale one is like pretty extensive in like as a toolkit. Like uh, taking this for example, this is like a Houdini Houdini toolkit, like doing a Rubik's cube. And um, the nice thing here is like you can just like take that process and replace it with type, for example, and it still works. The same here again. This is an After Effects tool, so you have this like toolkit that like creates those like puzzles and you can also like replace the input and it still works. If we are looking again like now at a um, at a client project, Pinterest is a more recent. Um, there's there's a lot of like those like push pin things that you might notice like things like this like or like patterns here and and if you look at those assets Again, they are also created in After Effects. But then um, look closely on the like top left with like the what what the user in this toolkit is doing. Like you have like all those like things that you're that you know in like fully developed tools. Like you have sliders, inputs, uh, checkboxes. You can basically like build build a tool within a tool. Um, and and usually it like serves like most purposes that you that you might might want. All right, so, but that might not always be the case that you can solve everything in this like toolkit fashion. So sometimes you like reach the limitations in, in conventional software. So let's say you have a, pro um, you have a problem where you cannot, uh, you don't have a tool or you cannot find a tool to solve it. Maybe you just have to like make, make your own tool. And it can be like something like seemingly simple like this like logo animation for Flowdesk. Uh, which is like a variable font interpolation, but things like this already like get pretty tricky with like conventional software. So maybe it makes more sense to to make your own tool that just like serves this one purpose of creating this animation. But it can also like look something like this. So um, it can also be the tool can be the main delivery for the client. So in in this example, SML Excel, we we created like a visual system. That, that looked somewhat like this and was accompanied by like a image filter. And then you see like how it works in like in web and uh, UX and then like, yeah, out of, out of home, how it, how it works. So the system itself is like kind of self-explaining. The name is uh, very giving here, like SML XL, right? So if I'm, if I'm taking this and stacking it and time offsetting, you already have the output. But um, for this, you don't really need to like build a tool, like why make it complicated? Like you can also just like achieve this in After Effects, which yeah, at the beginning, of course we did, like it's like quick quick testing, testing phase, exploration phase, like there's no no real reason to, to make a whole tool yet. But then if you like um, go for that, for that approach and you want like more flexibility and yeah, like more variety in output, it does maybe make make sense to like make a tool for this. But um, the other thing is then like the image, the image treatment, the image filter, that gets a little bit more tricky. That's already something like where I cannot really think of like a tool that that this would be like super easy with to to achieve in, in code. On the other hand, it's like it's pretty straightforward. Like you're taking image data, um, replacing it with like letters and then like check if the letter repeats um, its neighbor and then like stretch it until it, it reaches uh, a different letter essentially. And that's the whole, that's the whole system for the image treatment. So this is how the testing phase looks. Classic webcam. This is, I'm not sure this is not, not here, I think, but yeah. Um, and this is how it looks with memes and, and GIFs. So if we want to like, hand this over to, to a client, we have to like think of stuff like what, what inputs do we want to, do, um, to give to the client? So things like this, time offset, columns, um, column offset. So like 
yeah making listing out like what what we want what we want to have access to so vertical horizontal the amount of rows and um if we're like taking like all of these all of these things and just like randomizing them it yeah it generally works and then like building a ui around it and it looks somewhat like this so this is the tool that we like handed over to the client and this was like basically the core delivery um of of the branding and one thing you may notice is like you cannot access everything here so you cannot do things like change the the typeface and that's for a reason because we just don't want the client to change the typeface so what we're doing is like we are taking the limitations as an advantage so it used to be that um that you make a design manual like a this this is the new york city transit authority standard manual and then like you define like all those like rules and um, things that the client should follow is supposed to follow and just hope that that he does right and but instead if you like now creating creating software creating a tool for the client there's not really anything that he can do outside of the tool because uh, you're like having all those like all those rules all those limitations already like built and baked into the tool itself and with something like this you don't have to worry with like the the client breaking your your After Effects toolkit. So now we talked about self-made tools. Now we should um, also look a little bit like about uh, into into tools of the future. I am not trying to uh, attempt to go too deep into explaining automation at MIT, but um, brief. So if we talk about automation we talk about computerization and computerization is acceleration so what i said in the beginning why would i use a screwdriver if i can use a drill if i uh, simply compare like the just just the pure speed of a transistor with the human pre, uh, human brain then one week of com computer simulation is equal to 20000 years of human processing so it's just like intensely like insanely faster and what what that can do then for you is like tasks um, can be left to a machine in order to make better use of the human potential. So what does that mean? Like when I started in graphic design, I still had to do things like Photoshop cutouts. So you zoom all the way in and then you like trace trace the image by hand. And I would argue that this is not really the best use of human potential. And yeah, nowadays we have AI that can do that for you. But if you're like having this, um, if you're bringing up this like AI conversation, especially in our field nowadays, um, there's a lot of like fear that um, we are like building robots that that replace us, that um, make us yeah unnecessary in a way. But um, I I always like to like bring up this like one study from the Oxford University from 2013, the future of employment, that um, ranks the computerization probability of 702 jobs so it ranks art direction at a lower probability than graphic design and the way i see it here is like art direction is more connected to to concept and decision making and graphic design is um, more connected to the execution so craft and um what that what that mean or might mean is that uh, the idea is less likely to be computerized and the reason for that, I would say, is that intelligence is not creativity. So if I look at like what AI can do, and I would say this is not even like a really new um, new thing of like the last two years. No, this is like an example from 2015 is style transfer. And AI can do like wonderful uh, Van Gogh style paintings of Tübingen. But if this would be like the measurement of creativity, that would mean that like those art forgery factories um, would house the most creative people of, of our time, which I would say is not the case. But fast forward, if you like go to 2023 and look into like stable diffusion control net, like the lines are getting like a bit more blurry and I understand why like people like start to get afraid. But again, um, if I'm looking at this, have you ever like walked through, your, through a museum and like heard somebody say like, oh, I can paint that, I can do this. Well, but you haven't. And 
this is not really how we measure these things. Like it's it doesn't matter if you can execute it if you if the if the craft is there. It's that's not really it. It's all about it's the idea. So if it is all about the idea, then we have to talk about inspiration. And nowadays, I feel I see more and more that uh, design leads to design inspiration, leads to design, leads to design inspiration. And that can be very dangerous because if I'm looking at what AI can do, it, it's really good in like looking at faces and creating faces just fully on its own. And it can also do that with letters and with typography. But what is what it is not doing on its own is um, coming up with ideas like let's let's make a hypercube letter or a trumpet letter or something like this. So to me, this is like the the human advantage that we have over AI and um, to create something objectively wrong as um, create something create something objectively wrong as subjectively good. So I would like to. Um, promote to to break out of this like death spiral of like design leading to design inspiration and instead getting your inspiration somewhere else like maybe i mean you should first and foremost look into like the project brief and like get your inspiration like from there or like for r d like find inspiration in in your hobbies in in food architecture anything that's like outside of um of your bubble and that doesn't even have to be like the same for everyone. Like this, this might be like where where I find inspiration, but that doesn't mean that you have to find inspiration there, as well. But as long like as long as you break out of this bubble, you can like create things like this. Like this is um, a hyper glyph, and um, yeah, this is how we like created the the promotion post that you that you saw before that bear showed. Um, but that doesn't mean, like I in no means trying to say that that you should uh, turn your back to AI because um, I'm really doing the opposite. I'm I'm using AI every day, every single day, and um, that's ChatGPT, for example, and that can be like a great help for like programming and like to create tools like the this like hyperglyph, um, yeah, animation slash tool. The same, the same uh, is here. So, like, if I'm trying to like make a trumpet ladder, why not take advantage of those like tools that are out there, like Midjourney, Dali, the new Photoshop beta? There's like so much like AI that you can use for your advantage. And what it like comes down to is um, to to see AI, AI as assistive AI. So instead of like using AI or like letting AI do things on its own, like autonomously, it's um, assistive. It helps you. And now we're back at the beginning of the talk at, at tools. And it's just what AI is or how I see AI is just like more intelligent tools. So I started the, uh, I started the talk with a quote and I'm going to end it with a quote. But I like to use the word affected, not replaced, because I think if done right, it's not going to be AI replacing lawyers. It's going to be lawyers working with AI replacing lawyers who don't work with AI. All right, this uh, sums it up. This is if you want to see more, if you have questions, if you want to reach out, this is the studio, this is me. Um, thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much, Daniel. Please everyone give a big applause, either with an emoji or you can unmute if you want. Wow, that was so interesting. Thank you. Uh, and I really, I always really love your presentations because they're so, uh, they're also, they feel really close to you. And then it's just like all this crazy DIY work. Uh, so thank you so much for that. Um, so if you have any questions for Daniel, uh, please post them in the chat. There were already some questions. So we, we have some time for a Q and A. Um, I saw there were quite some questions about tools, which is also something that came up a lot, right, in your talk. Um, uh, so Vedit asked, um, what kind of tools are handed over to the brand uh, or organization that will implement them? Uh, it's like a challenging but fun way to uh, look at guidelining visual identity systems. So you already briefly talked about that uh, with the typography tool, but could you tell a bit more about that? Like how that process is for you? Um, okay, so it really depends. Like um, 
sometimes we we deliver like very classic like brand guidelines as well so like that's that's still the case but then um more often it's it's things like toolkits like it's a an after effects toolkit that's like um in a way like simplified so you like you hide all the layers that you don't want the client to touch and then you just like have like change content here change image here and uh this is your output so it's like you you build this toolkit that you can like safely hand over that's somewhat bulletproof but that's why i said before like if you like build full-on tools like it's like really bulletproof because you can always like in if you hand over an after effects tool you can obviously go into each layer and just change things and do adjustments that you maybe didn't um, have in mind. Like let's say uh, SML Excel, um, I could have like done somewhat of an After Effects tool for for this case, but like you, then you can do stuff like change the typography, mm -hmm. right? But like this is something that you can like really uh, limit in in uh, a full on tool. I'm not sure. Like does this uh, answer your question? I think or so. Yeah. Questions. I'm also wondering, like, if um, if that ever uh, happens, if you ever saw that people uh, that you handed the tool over use it in an unexpected way or in a way you didn't intend, because you also said you kind of misuse tools. So then it's interesting to see if your clients would do the same. Um, yeah, totally. I mean, it's um, it's totally out of our hands the moment we deliver it, right? So, and if you, you, you maybe have like intentions for like where you want um, the limitations in the in in this to be, where like you want the the brand to, what you want the brand to look like, but once you hand it over, it's, it's really up to the client. And some clients like are like very strict by it and like really follow it. But then there's also like moments when like maybe a brand is like older and it has like developed over like, and it's um it's been a few years so um yeah people like start to like play around with it get more like use it more freely that that definitely happens it's not always like um terrible right like it's sometimes um it's also interesting to see like what the client how like the client like sees your identity and evolves it and stuff um yeah it doesn't doesn't need to be bad yeah yeah, that's nice. That makes sense. Um, there's also some questions more about uh, art direction or design, um, which I think is also, it was really nice to hear you talk about uh, kind of the value of that and, and also in, in context of AI uh, replacing jobs. Um, so Yusef asks, uh, how does one build on their art direction skills? If it's an innately human quality, uh, where are the crossroads between craftsmanship and art direction, and where do they maybe diverge? Um, I think I think it's like very important to like have an understanding of of the craft. Like, let's say uh, I'm trying to like work with a developer, it really helps to have an understanding of developing to to really communicate that that properly. So it's like still you like you need you need to know the craft to to like art direct the craft mm -hmm. but um but at the same time like i'm yeah like if you like it, it's a bit of terminology thing too right but like if you're like the the way i separated those things and like craft and and idea and decision making is like if you are like this like um yeah internship level like graphic designer um that just like purely executes what what he got like handed to him then then yeah you're like in this stage this is a replaceable stage that um yeah that's it's just unfortunate because like in, in a way you're just like executing and now like you see more and more than like people um like art directors themselves like you maybe don't need to hire somebody to make like sketches because i can like quickly type it into like mid journey mm -hmm. and um make the sketches myself Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and um, maybe that's an, another question related to that, that you also briefly uh, talked about is inspiration. Um, so um, it, what, so specifically, maybe you, where do you find inspiration for your work outside of graphic design or the design fields? 
so um i mean i think what, what got also like probably already clear through throughout the talk i'm uh very interested in science and always have been so like i'm i really like to like look into i mean conway's game of life and then like how can i um use this and like make um make this like a system that can be yeah can be an identity or like a, a branded element or something or mm. um a hyper hyper cube or yeah things like this um but yeah it's like i mean honestly i'm it's it's every it's everywhere because like i also like traveled a lot and i i always find like a lot of inspiration through through different places where i am different people that i meet um mm. maybe it helps that i'm not like too much in the graphic design bubble here i'm like hanging out with a lot of architects then you look at a lot of like buildings and maybe that helps to think of like structures i don't really know but yeah you make a 3d font out of it or a 3d tool exactly <laughs> nice um and maybe that's also interesting because you i think the four of you are all have like a creative position right in the studio uh so um what do you your do your colleagues like share a similar inspiration or uh, is it very different and how do you uh, basically work with that so um I think we're like in the best way possible very different from each other which like so um yeah each like each of us have have different in interests different strengths and, and uh that also means that like sometimes I mean there's projects where we like all work together on a project but sometimes it like it's more suitable for like uh Mitch because like he's um an fame like fabulous jazz pianist and like has mm -hmm. like um a sense of like music and uh rhythm that i don't have i'm like i uh dropped out of like music when in in 10th grade so um there's like all those like uh differences which yeah we are we are using to our to our best advantage i would say nice and does it um also help you to get more interested in the inspiration of the other people in the studio yeah for sure i mean um especially like music as much as um i i didn't i didn't uh feel such a connection like growing up but like uh hearing hearing mitch uh talking about like music and um instruments like kind of like changed definitely changed my perspective on it and then also became very interested uh, interesting and like started to like look into these things as well so yes for sure nice um and uh jules asks or i'm sorry if i don't pronounce your name right uh, but jules asks how do you find a balance between personal creativity and meeting client requirements uh in your collaborations so how does that those things balance out for you um yeah i mean i kind of like it's I think we are like in this um, privileged position of like, we're like a small studio. We um, can deny jobs or like just take on the jobs that like we really want and like that we, um, that, that really interest us. So that means like, if um, that also gives us the opportunity to say like, maybe we just had this job, we finished this job, like maybe we just like, uh, take a break to for like one or two weeks and then just like do an explorational phase and uh, do some testing. So um, that, that that just works kind of like that only really works because we are so small. Mm. And you you also work remotely, right? So you're not all in the same country yeah. or even continent most of the time. Uh, and Zach also asked, um, or is also curious to hear, um, about how that works so how you do that remote work together and also how you share work in progress or um, even discuss motion work remotely um yeah so mm, <laughs> it also like this uh the remote work has has transformed over the time a little bit because um we started to be like mostly remote like pre-pandemic already so and then like um during the pandemic like i was in europe they like like actually like yeah me and mitch and mac like they were in europe and then diana was in new york 
and um, it it moved around. So like we we switched time zones, and um, the way we like usually tackle it is, I think Mitch and Mac at the moment are just like shifting their day to later of the day, right, Mitch? I mean, I see him in the. <laughs> I'm seeing in the in the talk right now. Like I think they're like starting in the afternoon and and finish at night. <laughs> at the moment, but yeah, I think I mean it's it's if there's um if there's check-ins, I think like we like, I mean it needs to work in every time zone, right? Like if there if you're having clients from San Francisco or from uh, all over the world, it's I think mm -hmm. we're like just like trying to like meetings where the most the, the biggest overlap is. I feel like and, um, you spend like two thirds yeah. of the all the time zones. So you need like one more person somewhere else, and then you can have like a twenty four hour running studio. Yeah, we were talking about that. <laughs> we, <were> like, <laughs> we should maybe like you know more de decentralize um, our our studio. Nice. Um, so there's a few more questions also about uh, client work and and working with clients. Um, so Sophia asks, um, oftentimes we have a very tight schedule with client works. It will, it will be great to hear how you manage time to experiment and deliver something presentable uh, and understandable to clients. And um, if that's a, yeah, if that's a situation that you also have to face or if that is actually working fine for you as a studio. I think... Um... I think the way it works in like in our studio specifically is that we established this uh, relation with our our relationship with our clients that like they know that like we are doing a lot of like research a big testing phase in the beginning of the project um so like often it's just like this is like part of the deal like it's like this is like phase one testing and exploration right mm -hmm. but um as i said in the talk it's it's not always just it's just not always possible like we have like it's Sometimes it's very tight deadlines, things have, have to like, there's deliveries. Um, so if that's the case, there is not really too much room for exploration, but because we have this like huge archive of, of like personal R&D that we like can, um, can go back to, like we can like, there's maybe something like, even if it's just a starting point that we like, or this like fits within the scope of the project, this is something that like makes sense with the, um, mm -hmm with like what we're trying to achieve. So like you can like then like grab some old explorations and like then iterate on those and, and make them fit even better. Mm. Yeah, that's nice. that makes sense. Um, and so there's, yeah, I think that it's interesting also to hear that you even as a studio that is really successful in what they do, you still have to find that balance and sort of search for it. Uh, but at least you have a, li a little bit of space. So that's also great to hear. Um, so there's a few more questions also about uh, tools. Uh, Stephen asks, or Stephen uh, asks, um, so given that your experiments in your studio begin with self-initiation, how do you index the tools that you make and where do they live? How do you store them? Um. Yeah, fair question. It's it depends. It's a bit like all all over the place. It's like sometimes we are like, um, yeah, we have like made some testing that like um, landed on, on social media, that landed on like uh, Instagram, and then like in a way that's an archive or like that. Like when I started in the studio, like we kind of even like saw social media as like a somewhat of an archive, and mm -hmm. um, just like. Put a little bit like step back from from social like over like over the last couple of years but it can be something like this but it's also yeah it's it's that's a tricky question like we're mm -hmm. not like it, it's not that we have like an internal archive that we just like like a search engine that we go through it's uh on it's on our computers it's on in previous decks like sometimes mm -hmm. like you um we created some like mood board, internal mood board for ourselves, like having like containing tests that like worked for like one project. And then we like having a project that's like in a similar realm. So we like look at that again. Um, so things like this. And do you then ever um, get back to earlier sketches that you didn't use for another project? 
does it happen sometimes? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, definitely, yeah. Mm. And uh, like it's, I think it's 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 all fair as long as it's not. Um, as long difficult. as you didn't use right. it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that makes sense. That's also kind of the added value of um, coding or making something custom that you can change it a little bit. Um, so there's another. There's so a few more questions about tools. Um, how do you make a decision on which tools to use? Because you have this whole range of different software. So how how does that process look? Um, yeah, that's also a totally fair question. Like I think um, I would say usually like it starts with like an idea, with a concept, with sometimes with with a sketch, and uh, um, then it it might just be like either instinctive and be like okay this is like i know i can do this like with cinema because i've done something in that area before um and if it's something like you completely never touched before like maybe like it's google research and you're just mm -hmm. like what uh, how can i do this doing uh classic like tutorials with 300 views you know like those kind of like um uh, making making research how to how to do something and um Figuring and figuring it out that way. Like nowadays, like there's like so many tools out there. Mm -hmm. Like even like uh, with all the like small AI software and like I'm I've never been like a big a fan of like that. I have to commit even to one tool. Sometimes I'm like you know you start in After Effects, then you like take the animation and put it in Cinema, and then you like take this. So like you don't even need to like um, really make that decision mm -hmm. always. That's, yeah, that's true. So it's also often a combination of multiple things. Um, Gia Loon asks about that. Um, so how do you sort of keep a like a cohesive system if you use these different tools or programs? Is there like a specific, uh, I don't know, software or guideline that you start with? Um. No, I mean, how do? What do you mean by cohesive system? I I would like to, um, I would need some more. So I think the question is, because you're when you're using different tools, you probably have different restrictions, or things might look a little bit different. So, uh, if you use different tools in one project, like how do you make sure it's a cohesive, uh, whole at the end? Yeah, I mean, you're you're establishing rules for yourself, and like even if you like even if you don't write them down for like a guideline uh, at the end, but if you like have, um, let's take Squarespace, it's plain black and white. It's those like sculptures that have like, that follow a logic and I can program that. I can build that in After Effects. I can do that in cinema, but it's still always the same logic. It still mm -hmm. always like follows the same rules and, and guidelines that you define. Yeah. Um, so so you in a way it rules. doesn't matter what tools you use. Yeah, so you have actually the rules before you even start on a tool or before you even start. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that makes very much sense. Um, so we have two more minutes, but I think there's two more questions I'd like to ask uh, or that, yeah, that people in the chat asked. Uh, so Devon uh, says, uh, Namaste from India. Um, how do you think generative type as a dynamic assistive tool or AI can make design uh, more democratic. Um, for example, or yeah, there's a few examples. So for example, ind indigenous scripts from local uh, Indian languages need to be digitized or other scripts that don't use the Latin alphabet. So I think the question is more like, do you think these tools can help design, uh, make design more democratic? And if so, in which ways? I mean, um, one hundred percent, and I, I don't only see that for like the for future tools for like AI. It's it's already like if you take glyphs, um, I would say like type design before glyphs was uh, way less accessible for type designers because like it's um, the programs that were used before like were like super complex, um, not like yeah not very easy to like learn and understand and now like glyphs comes and uh you see more and more like yeah students starting to like make make own fonts own tests and um like that is democrat 
democratizing um, type design to me. Mm. The same, yeah, if you look at like Photoshop, uh, at any, like, I think any software in a way, like makes, if it makes things easier, it makes things more accessible, uh, mm. which I, I always see as an advantage. Great, thank you for that answer. Um, and I think the, the final question I want to ask is more for uh, people that start in this field. So would you have any advice for someone that's starting to make the kinetic typography and tools? Um, yeah, I mean, do a, a lot of like personal projects, honestly. Like I feel like when I was a student, I was like doing a lot of like stuff on the side, not even like, not just the student projects. I did like uh, things that I wanted to do that I were interested in. And um, I believe that even like got me the job at Dia. Like I did something like, did some like personal project and like um, was sending sending them and they were like, oh, this is cool. Let's, um, let's bring him. Hmm. So I think, yeah, testing R&D R &D is the answer in a way. That's a very good advice. Uh, I wish we had more time, uh, but it's already one here. Um, Daniel, thank you so much and for your amazing presentation uh, and also for answering all these questions so openly. And um, yeah, this is the end of our speaker series. Um, please give another big applause to Daniel and Diaz Studio. Yeah, so great. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. It was a pleasure. Like it was so nice to nice to be able to speak here. Thank you. Yeah, it was the pleasure was all ours. Um, so we've recorded these talks and they'll be up very soon, uh, transcribed on the website. Um, uh, next to thanking Dia Studio, I also want to thank the other speakers: uh, Space Type Studio, Yusman Rossum, Talia Cotton, Peter Cho, and Beatrice Lozano. And then also thanks to Zach Lieberman, uh, my PI, for organizing or helping uh, organizing this. And thank you all for joining and um, we'll see you at the next series, hopefully in the spring. Goodbye everyone. <laughs>